The spectacle lynchings of Mr. Herbert Lee and Mr. Lewis Allen on September 25th, 1961. Five years ago, the FBI announced that it was reopening more than 100 unsolved murder cases from the civil rights era of the 1950s and 60s. The goal of the Cold Case Initiative was to try and mete out justice in what seemed to be racially motivated killings that were never prosecuted. Not many 50-year-old cold cases ever get solved. Memories fade, evidence is lost, witnesses and suspects die or disappear. But that's not the case in the death of Lewis Allen, a mostly forgotten but historically significant murder that helped bring thousands of white college students to Mississippi in the Freedom Summer of 1964. The murder is still unsolved, but the case has never quite gone away because the chief suspect is very much alive and walking the streets of a town called Liberty. Liberty, Mississippi is a small rural logging town not far from the Louisiana border. The FBI believes that some people here have been keeping a dark secret for nearly 50 years from one of the ugliest periods in the state's history. You will not be allowed to proceed past this point today. It was a time when civil rights activists were beaten and arrested, when state and local politics were controlled by all-white citizens' councils, and when people like Lewis Allen were murdered in cold blood without redress. You keep a photo of Lewis Allen on your desk? I do. What? The case bothers me. I feel like we failed, and not just the FBI, but law enforcement. Cynthia Deedle is a 15-year veteran of the FBI's Civil Rights Division and until a few weeks ago was in charge of the Cold Case Initiative. Of the 100 unsolved, racially motivated murders she's been charged with investigating, none has been more promising or frustrating than Lewis Allen's. Somebody knows something. Some husband came home with bloody clothing. Someone got drunk in a bar and said what he was doing last night. Someone knows something. But in the early 1960s, people in and around Liberty knew to keep their mouths shut. A violent chapter of the Ku Klux Klan used cross burnings, abductions, and murder to enforce the doctrine of white supremacy and to intimidate the black population, most of which lived in shacks with no electricity or plumbing and were not allowed to vote. Civil rights leaders like Robert Moses, who came south to help them register, were frequently the target of violence. Liberty was not a place that I liked to go. Why? Because it was a place where you weren't safe if you were doing voter registration work. It was in Liberty that Moses met Lewis Allen, a rough-hewn World War II veteran who walked proud and was not afraid to stand up for himself. He ran a small timber business, was one of the few blacks in Liberty to own his own land, and always wore a hat, which he considered a sign of self-respect. He was not the type to seek out trouble. Robert Moses says it found him. He was at the wrong place at the wrong time. He saw something that happened, and he was deeply uh, disturbed and affected by that, and so he had a, a basic life decision to make. On September 25th, 1961, Allen was walking past this old cotton gin when he saw something that likely got him killed. Lewis Allen witnessed a powerful state legislator by the name of E.H. Hurst shoot and kill an unarmed black man named Herbert Lee. Allen told his friends and family that he and other eyewitnesses had been pressured into lying about the shooting, into saying that it was self-defense. E.H. Hurst, member of the Mississippi House of Representatives from Amity County. He was in office from 1960 to 1964, preceded by Frank T. Wall, succeeded by Frank T. Wall. He was born Eugene Hunter Hurst, Jr., October 21st, 1908, Liberty, Mississippi, United States of America. He died April 20th, 1990, at the age of 81, in Magnolia, Mississippi, United States of America. His political party that he represented was Democratic. I want you to remember the word Democrat and Republican. If you are a Negro in America, 
If you are a Negro in America, you have no business voting as a Democrat or a Republican. Both sides are Klan-based, white supremacist-based, and fusionist-based. I want you to get that understanding right now. You're going to see what a Democrat did in September 25th, 1961, this guy by the name of Eugene Hunter Hearst Jr., he's noted for killing a man by the name of Herbert Lee by fatally shooting him midday on September 25th, 1961 at a cotton gin. This was an unprovoked attack. Hearst was ruled to have acted in self-defense by the all-white jury at the inquest held that day. Mr. Herbert Lee was a so-called African-American man married with nine children who was a charter member of the NAACP in that county and he had been trying to register black voters in Liberty, Mississippi. The small hometown of both this white guy, the Democrat, Eugene Hunter Hearst Jr., and also Mr. Herbert Lee, who was a victim of typical white supremacist spectacle lynching behavior. Later, Allen decided that he needed to tell the truth. One of the people Lewis Allen told it to was Julian Bond, who was trying to register black voters in Mississippi for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He would later become a legendary civil rights leader. This was not a self-defense action uh, by the state representative. This was out-and-out out murder. That's all it was. But Lewis Allen agreed to lie about that. Why do you think he lied? He lied because he was in fear of his life. If he had implicated a powerful white man in a murder of a black man, then he was risking his life. Did you encourage him to tell the truth? I tried to encourage him to tell the truth, but, I, you know, it was like saying, why don't you volunteer to be killed? But Allen's wife would later testify that his conscience was clipping him, and he decided to tell FBI agents and the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights what really happened at the cotton gin. This document from FBI file says Allen changed his story and expressed fear that he might be killed. He asked for protection, but none was provided. Almost immediately, word began circulating in Liberty that Lewis Allen was prepared to change his testimony. He was threatened um, as a result of the fact that he was going to change his statement, that he did change his statement. And the FBI was notified of those threats? Yes. Did the FBI do anything? Yes, we referred that to local law enforcement authorities. It's certainly possible to conclude the local law enforcement people were the ones behind the threats. There is a theory out there that, that speaks to that, yes. In fact, it's been the prevailing theory for some time, although the FBI cannot officially confirm it. There is a 1961 reference in the FBI file to a report that Allen was to be killed and the local sheriff was involved in the plot to kill him. And we found this 1962 letter from Robert Moses to Assistant Attorney General John Doerr alleging the same thing. They're after him in a mid county, it says, and makes reference to a plot by the sheriff and seven other men. He was afraid of the sheriff's department. I think he was, yes. And I think he was afraid of the Klan. Although they seem yeah. to be sort of the same thing in Liberty at this time. I'm not sure I can say that. Julian Bond was less circumspect. The law enforcement, you were suspected, they were members. If you wanted to be a mayor, a city councilman, a county commissioner, the sheriff, if you wanted to be in the legislature, you had to have some connection with the Klan. And in the Amit County Sheriff's Department, the person with the best connection was Deputy Sheriff Daniel Jones. His father was the exalted cyclops of the local Klan, and Jones himself, according to this FBI document we found, was suspected of being a Klan member. Jones, who's alive and still resides in Liberty, was recently visited by FBI agents who wanted him to take a lie detector test. What was he like? Well, mean. Hank Allen was 17 years old when his father was killed, and he remembers Daniel Jones as his main tormentor. 
He says he watched Jones harass and repeatedly arrest his father on trumped-up charges and one night beat him outside their home. And uh, he had handcuffed him, told him he was under arrest. So Dad asked for his hat. He told Dad, no, you can't go get your hat. Dad said, well, Dad, my son is on the porch. Can he bring me my hat? He draw back, he took a flashlight, and he struck my dad and broke his jawbone, handcuffed. When he got out of jail, Lewis Allen did something that was unheard of for a black man in Mississippi. He went to the FBI and lodged a complaint against Deputy Sheriff Jones and testified before a federal grand jury. The case was thrown out, and the situation in Liberty continued to deteriorate. They stopped selling daddy gas in the town. They stopped buying his logs. They just more or less just tried to blackball him. It got to the point, the harassment and just him not being able to survive in Liberty, that he decided to leave and to go work in another state. And it's the night before he is due to leave that he is killed. Lewis Allen was ambushed here on a cold night in January 1964 after getting out of his truck to open the cattle gate that led to his property. His son, Hank, was the one who found him. I didn't know why he would park the truck in the middle of the driveway and leave it like that. Mm -hmm. And I climbed up in the truck. The headlights was real dim. And when I went to step down out the truck, I stepped on something. And that's when I stepped on my, my, my daddy's hand. Uh, he was lying up under the truck. He was killed with two blasts of deer shot to the head. The investigating officer was none other than the newly elected sheriff, Daniel Jones, who Hank said made it clear to the family why his father had been murdered. He told my mom that if Lewis had just shut his mouth, that he wouldn't be laying there on the ground. He wouldn't be dead. You think Sheriff Jones did it? Yes, indeed. By all means. If he didn't do it, he was the entrepreneur of it. Jones told the newspapers he was unable to find a single clue. How would you characterize the investigation that Sheriff Jones conducted? He did not develop any fingerprints, any physical evidence, and he never developed any suspects. Not a great investigation. Probably could have done more. And the same might be said about the FBI at the time. It had limited jurisdiction over civil rights murders and little inclination to investigate them. In fact, it's not clear that anyone investigated Lewis Allen's murder until 1994, when Plater Robinson, an historian at the Southern Institute at Tulane University, began digging into it. From day one in Liberty, people told me that Daniel Jones and a colored man killed Lewis Allen. Robinson has spent 17 years combing through archives and tracking down people to interview. One of them was an elderly preacher named Alfred Knox. Knox told Robinson in a 1998 tape-recorded conversation that his son-in-law, Archie Weatherspoon, was with Sheriff Daniel Jones when Allen was murdered. My son-in-law went with him. To yeah. kill Lewis Allen? Yeah, to kill Lewis Allen. He didn't know where he was going until he got in the car. And he said, uh, would you pull the trigger? Would you shoot him? He said, no, I'm going to do it. That's what my son-in-law said, I ain't going to shoot him. Uh, you come out and you kill him, you kill him. So, he killed him. Both Knox and his son-in-law took their stories to the grave. But Plater Robinson says the answer to who killed Lewis Allen can still be found in Liberty. A lot of people are dead, but there's still a number of significant people still alive. Like who, besides Sheriff Jones? Well, Charles Ravencraft, he lives down the road. He's quite healthy. Thus saith Yahweh Elohim, feed the flock of the slaughter, whose possessors slay them, and hold themselves not guilty. And they that sell them say, Blessed be the Lord, for I am rich. And their own shepherds pity them not. For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith Yahweh. But lo, I will deliver the men, every one, into his neighbor's hand, and into the hand of his king. And they shall smite the land, and out of their hand I will not deliver them. Zechariah the 11th chapter fourth through the sixth verse please focus on the fifth verse that says whose possessors slay them and hold themselves not guilty 
We found Charles Ravencraft at the Liberty Drug Store, presiding over a coffee clutch of old timers, some of whom were around when Lewis Allen was murdered. People in this area that it just did don't do much talking. For years, Ravencraft was sergeant at arms of the Mississippi legislature, and at the time of Lewis Allen's murder, vice president of the Americans for the Preservation of the White Race and Liberty, a front group for the Ku Klux Klan. Was it around, Charles? What was that? Klan. Sure. In here. Were any of you guys in it? They wanted about a Klan. You don't tell everybody what the business was. Ravencraft indicated that he hadn't lost much sleep over Lewis Allen's murder and told us he had no idea who killed him. No, I don't. He lived a lot longer than I thought he'd lived. The kind of fellow he was, a little bit over there. I don't think the civil rights had anything to do with it. Winborn Sullivan wasn't around when Lewis Allen was killed, but he ran the Liberty Drug Store for 36 years. I think there are people who know what happened and who did it. And they're very, and they, but they're not willing to talk about it, and they won't talk about it. You'll, you'll never find out. They told us they don't see much of former Sheriff Daniel Jones these days. He spends most of his time on his property just off the state highway. We decided to approach him with our cameras concealed, on the off chance he might give something up. After waiting for a half an hour on the porch, he rolled up in an all-terrain vehicle with his wife. Hello. My name's Steve Croft. How Please, you doing? Pleased to meet you all. We're from 60 Minutes in New York. We're down here working on a story on an old case of yours and was wondering if you'd have some time to talk to us about it. No, sir, I don't believe so. You don't think so? No, sir. The Lewis Allen case? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. He was polite and cordial. You know, Said he didn't want to talk, but he kept on talking. There was some bad blood between you and, uh, and, and Lewis, right? It was not no bad blood between them. Apparently, uh, I'm talking more than I need to, but I'm a, uh, the truth sometimes has a way of slipping out if you try to keep it covered up. Mm -hmm. Were you in the Klan? Oh, I won't answer that one. I'll take the filth on that one. Jones confirmed that the FBI had already been there asking some of the same questions. When I told you I don't care to discuss it anymore, mm -hmm. and you just keep coming to your... <laughs> Well, educated approach. No, it's not my educated approach. Look, you haven't told me to get off your property. I just uh, asked me one, uh, one last question. Okay, be sure it's the last one. Can you look me on and say you weren't involved in it? No, sir, I wasn't involved in it. Well, you know, Sheriff, sure, you could clear this up with a lie detector test. I don't know. Well, they don't get cleared up. The theory that Invisible. Sheriff Jones killed Lewis Allen has been in the public domain for quite some time. The FBI would be remiss in our duties if we did not pursue that theory. And it's still just a theory, a circumstantial case based on motive, suspicions, hearsay, and the words of dead people. There's no forensic evidence, no murder weapon, no eyewitnesses, and only one FBI agent working the case part-time. My name is Cynthia Deedle. At a town hall meeting in nearby Baton Rouge, Deedle tried to shake out some new leads and enlist journalists, activists, and students to help the FBI solve the murder. But there were some in the audience who still mistrust the FBI and think the cold case initiative is little more than public relations. There has been nothing did. There has been not one arrest. There has been all kind of investigations made. And I hate to say things like this. Because the FBI is the only help I got. Should the FBI be doing more? If they're, of course if they're... they should be doing more. You know, thank God for these people who are doing it. But we can't turn law enforcement over to journalists. We can't turn it over to academics. We can't depend on some guy at Tulane to tell us who's killing people in Mississippi. Come on. Why are you relying on reporters and <laughs> professors and people in people the town? People who are not I mean, in the you, FBI. This is the most powerful law enforcement agency in, in the country. Uh, you have subpoena power. We do. We have resources that uh, we could bring to bear on any case. Why don't you bring them? They have been, but I've learned in these cases that a witness, um, a family member, may be more comfortable talking to you than she would be talking to me. For Hank Allen, the time to solve his father's killing was 47 years ago. He believes the people who know what happened, black and white, would rather forget it now, and that the wall of silence and the passage of time have granted immunity to those he thinks are responsible. 
here's a guy goes on living his normal life, enjoying life, but they feel as though we're doing something wrong by saying something about the murder. In other words, you should be quiet about that. That was in the past. Well, it's still in my present and in my future. I have to look at this every day. The tenth song. Why standest thou afar off, O Yah? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Most High abhorreth. The wicked through the pride of his continence will not seek after the Most High. Yah is not in all his thoughts. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. He hath said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud, a lying bastard. Under his tongue is mischief and vanity. Wicked bastards always stirring up mischief. What's your backpedaling for? Yes, it's wonderful to have people of color in your life if you're white. Many, many, many people, white people, don't have people of color in close relationships. But that doesn't mean your life is free of racism. That doesn't mean you don't have a white experience or a white perspective. And it also doesn't mean that racism will not surface in your relationships with people of color. So if we go underneath and we look at the pillars that are supporting that kind of superficial ways that we're taught to think about racism, we see individualism as a very powerful prop or support, this idea that each of us is unique and outside of socialization. We see universalism, which is kind of the opposite of individualism. Individualism says, why can't we all be different? And universalism says, why can't we all be the same? This is a very popular ideology in religious or faith communities. And I'm not arguing that on a deep spiritual level, we're not all universally the same. But we don't live, if you will, in the spiritual realm. We live in the physical realm. And here in the physical realm, we have to ask ourselves, how does it function to say we're, we all bleed under the skin? Well, it functions to take race off the table, to take power off the table, to deny that we have fundamentally different experiences because racism is real. And while race isn't real, in other words, at the biological level, there is no real, true race or racial difference as we're, we're taught to um, understand it, these very superficial signifiers of racial difference that um, allow us to categorize people, these are very real in their consequences for people's lives. And this insistence that we're all one doesn't allow us to engage with that social reality. I try to help white people see how race functions in our lives. And I try to move us away from the really um, obvious, evident examples, such as a racist joke or a racist action or you know things that would be recognizable to everybody, right? The kinds of acts that cause people like me, well-meaning people like me, to say, I couldn't possibly be racist, I don't do those things. And I try to help white people understand racism as the very fabric of our society. And I think the most profound example of everyday racism is segregation that most white people live in racial segregation. While we may work, 
with people of color. When we go home, people of color are rarely at our dinner table. And I don't mean setting our table. I mean sitting and breaking bread with us, true relationships in our lives. Many people can recognize the explicit kind of conscious dislike type of racism, racist jokes, racist expressions, the KKK. But I want to speak to, I want to help white people see the everyday racism that's embedded and that we participate in. And I want to look at neighborhood and school segregation as an example. I'm going to start with this app here. These are the app's founders. It's a new app called The Sketch Factor. And what it does is when you go to a new city, you can put in where you are and it tells you which neighborhoods to avoid because they're sketchy. And of course, sketchy is very much associated with race and class in, in the white mind. And so now we have the convenience of segregation through an app. We don't actually have to talk to other white people about, you know, where are the good neighborhoods and the bad neighborhoods. And that good neighborhood, bad neighborhood, good schools, bad schools discourse is an example of new racism. I don't think it it gets by anybody that that is racially coded language. So this way we can come out and police those racial boundaries without ever kind of naming race. But we all know what we're talking about. And I think the most profound way that my life has been shaped by my race is through the power of segregation. Most white people do live in segregation. We choose that segregation. And in a lot of ways we celebrate it. What makes a school good and what makes a neighborhood good? Well, the absence of people of color. That is the way that white people measure the value of their neighborhoods and schools. And while we don't come out and name that, we all know what it is. And so I have had to think very deeply on what it means to have grown up in a primarily white neighborhood, to be born into, to go to school, to study, to learn, to play, to worship, to love, to work, and to die in segregation and not have one single person who loved, mentored, or guided me convey that there was any loss. And I'm gonna repeat that because I think it's very profound and I really want us to sit with it. That I could live my whole life in segregation. In fact, if I followed the trajectory that my loving parents laid out for me in my good neighborhood and my good school and my good college and my good career in which I would ideally rise to the top, I could easily never have any consistent, ongoing, authentic relationships with people of color and not one person who guided me ever conveyed that there was loss. Again, verse 9, he lied in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lied in wait to catch the poor. The Burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. Yahweh is jealous. And Yahweh revengeth, Yahweh revengeth, and is furious. Yahweh will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. Yahweh is slow to anger, and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. Yahweh hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet he rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and drieth up all the rivers bashan languisheth and carmel and the flower of lebanon languisheth nahum first chapter First verse through the fourth verse. Shalom. We pray for Laiwalam Shabbat. Eternal rest for Mr. Lewis Allen and Mr. Herbert Lee and their respective Hebrew Israelite families. 
we pray, Shalom, peace and comfort. Be whole, be complete in this hour as the anniversary of the spectacle lynchings of these two Hebrew Israelite brethren taking place on September 25th, 1961. And the FBI can't figure out a way to solve this, these murders nor can they bring these free white supremacist KKK Klansmen. They cannot bring them or any of their cohorts to justice. This is a spectacle lynching that the FBI cannot solve. 